Let's talk. Same thing for the story. We want to clear up from last class uh, before we come. The first thing is this uh, silly issue about signs. Uh, it's not going to be very, very illuminating since we confused ourselves about the signs of the action last class. Let's get that. Okay. The first question we should ask is how do you know what is a correct sign? Yeah, how do you know what is the correct sign of the action? Just starting with the, the first action, yeah, which by the way has a name, it's called the number of action. So remember we said that the action was equal to minus 1 by 4 pi, or 2 pi alpha, right? Times uh, determinant, well, square root of minus del, del alpha x mu del alpha x mu. Uh, that, that was the action. Okay, so just to convince you that this is the right physical sign of the action, let's do the following. Let's take a configuration of this uh, of this string um, that stretches infinitely long in the x y direction. <coughs> okay, so we've got a string whose best right string configuration is stretching infinitely long in the x x one direction. So the origin in all other spatial directions. Okay, and for this string. Let's be completely physical here. Let's use a gauge such that x1 of sigma is equal to x1 and tau is equal to, is equal to x0. And let's look at what this action becomes uh, in this gauge. Okay? Uh, we're only using this for interpretation purposes here. So we'll also confine ourselves to an action for small subsections <coughs> around this equal. So we'll uh, confine ourselves to an action that is quadratic in fluctuations. Okay? And let's see what this becomes. Useful exercise. Make contact with something. Okay. So what do we get? Well, so first let's write out this stuff in one here. So this s is equal to minus 1 by 10 pi alpha prime. And then there's integral. And then this fancy determinant, as we saw last time, could be written as uh, minus x mu dot x mu dot times x mu prime x mu mu prime and then plus x mu dot dot times x mu <coughs> prime for the things. Okay? Uh, this is minus and this is plus, this is minus and this is plus. Fine. Now I want to I want to take this action and expand it to quadratic order in touch. So the first question I ask is, is there any term of this action that's not zero? At zero fluctuations. Is there a background piece of this action? And clearly there is, because x mu dot x dot x mu dot is not zero, because uh, it gets contributions from x zero. So that part is minus one, because of the negative metric in the time direction. In the space, the time direction space. And x mu prime, x mu prime is not zero from the contribution in the x1 direction, but that part is plus one. Okay, so we see that to zero order, the action evaluates to square root of any type of square root of one. Great. Now let's let's deal with fluctuations. Uh, this term is zero in the background. Okay, and. Uh, 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 Okay, so this term is zero. Okay, let we should do this carefully. Let me just take. We should do it carefully, but let me just take uh, what comes from this term just to save time. We get some addition. What bother us very much? So very quickly, if we want to do do what what comes from this term, we'd have to take background here and fluctuation here, or background here and fluctuation here. So background here and fluctuation here gives us minus. X mu dot x mu dot. Okay, so now first is mu. Uh, this mu should become uh, this mu should become i. You see, because of these things, uh, of these d degrees of freedom, two have been cage fixed, so they're not they're not dynamic degrees of freedom. Okay. So it's only the remaining d minus two that are that are dynamic degrees of freedom. So the part the part where mu runs over either zero the time coordinate or one the 
coordinate where we engage phase. Only contribution factor. There are no fluctuations in those, those dimensions. Is this clear? Okay, so okay, suppose we were doing the writing, rewriting exactly. Uh, I we should hurry up. But suppose we were doing the rewriting exactly. Actually, this still won't even contribute to quadratic code for this reason. So suppose we were doing the rewriting exactly, what will this thing become? So this thing would become minus one plus x mu xi dot xi dot. Okay, this term would become um, 1 plus xi prime xi prime. And this term would become plus xi dot xi prime. So this case, this is an exact rewriting of the expression about making no assumptions. Okay? Now you see that this thing is called is called fixed. We really don't even need to. It's the quadratic order we can figure out, right? Now the quadratic order, what do we get? We get 1 by 2 pi alpha prime. Then because we're doing the quadratic order, we get a half from the square root. And we get integral of, uh, 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 and there, sorry, there was a minus sign here, from this minus sign. So we get integral of 1 um, minus xi dot xi dot plus xi prime xi. Uh, sorry, if I've written the square roots, let do. Which is equal to 1 by 2 pi, 1 by 4 pi alpha prime in the integral of 1, well, 2, uh, and I'm drawing my minuses, minus, and this is now minus xi dot xi dot plus xi prime. Is this good? Okay? So now we can not constant term of the action, who cares about it? Uh, uh, though it might just for future purposes, let's remember that it's a negative constant term. Okay? So this is uh, 1 by 2 pi alpha prime minus plus 1 by 4 pi alpha prime into xi dot squared minus xi prime. Now this you see is a physical action. Because this, this gives you a physical action because it has positive kinetic. Okay? So it gives you a physical actuation for action for fluctuations of the string. In a condensed matter course, if you write down an action for fluctuations of the string, you would write down this action with some phenomenological tension. Okay? So that determines the sign of what we started with. That better have been months. Okay. Now we saw that uh, uh, we saw that last time that we got the say this was equivalent classically to one by four pi uh, alpha prime with a plus or minus, which there was a process point where we took the square root. We weren't sure which time sign to take. Uh, one by four pi alpha prime square root minus g g alpha beta del alpha x mu del alpha x. Okay. okay. Which time should we be taking? Well, there are two arguments, both of which give you the same answer if you do them carefully. Though one of them was, I was doing it confusedly last time, getting the wrong answer. The first argument is where we better have the kinetic term positive for the physical fluctuations. Now, the physical fluctuations are the I fluctuations. So they are no sign from the space time metric. Okay? But the uh, kinetic term does have a sign from the world shape metric, that have a minus from the world shape metric. Okay? So if we want to make it positive, this is better be the negative sign. Is this clear? Uh, what I was getting confused about was the false definiteness of this action last time. But it, it, that was stupid confusion. As we can see, okay, let's take the same configuration as before and check that on the background, this thing evaluates something negative. Okay? Um, it, it, so what the configuration we're looking at is that x0 is equal to tau and x prime is equal to uh, you know, sigma, some constant. Uh, x1 sigma. Okay? Now let's see. You see, the x1 part is clearly positive because both signs are positive. But the x0 part is also positive because both signs are negative. So in here you get something positive and that there's a minus sign which agrees with this minus sign. In fact, value will also be because you get 2 which cancels out. Is this clear? 
Okay, so from any, any point of view, folks, look correct. The last time I was remembering the minus sign and world sheet of metric by forgetting the minus sign for x0 in space time. Okay, so this is the right sign when in the process, in the derivation, when we took the square root, we should take this. Any questions about Okay, great. So that was clearing up points number one. Now we want to go back to our quantizations. Okay. So we want to go back to our quantization of the string. Let me remind you of what we uh, of what we saw. We decided to do the quantization. We decided to do the quantization in this uh, polyapo, the so-called polyapo action. So we decided to work with one by four by alpha prime with minus square minus g integral of uh, the alpha beta del alpha x mu. Okay, then we fix gauge, we gauge fix. Uh, remember this action was classically equal to the real action only when both of your morphisms as well as wild, wild transformations were treated as gauge invariants. Now we fix gauge to set g alpha beta equal to eta, the flat Minkowski metric of the whole sheet. There you go. But we realized that this gauge fixing procedure did not completely fix it. Okay. There were uh, uh, defining sigma plus and sigma minus. Sigma plus is tau plus sigma. Sigma minus is equal to tau minus sigma. Okay. There were uh, uh, gauge, gauge transformations that were not fixed. We could have performed sigma plus is equal to f of sigma plus tilde, for instance. And sigma minus is equal to g of sigma minus tilde. Okay. Now this looks like a very small amount of, of gauge uh, ambiguity, because this function is one value around two. But it's precisely the sort of gauge ambiguity that is relevant to classical physics, that is important to classical physics. Okay. Uh, and, wh and why is that? Um, uh, that's because we saw that solutions to the equations of motion, the classical solutions to the equations of motion, and all the x's being a function of sigma plus plus is a function of sigma minus. Okay? So Naively it appeared uh, as if we had 26 functions of sigma plus, d functions of sigma plus, and d functions of sigma minus. Now, those d functions were each constrained to be a constraint equation, which I'll remind you of in a moment. So that, that looked like it went to d minus 1. However, this reparameterization invariance actually tells you that it's d minus 2 functions of sigma plus and d minus 2 functions of sigma minus that parameterize the equivalent solution. Okay, that was an important crucial point. So the space of classical solutions was space of d minus two functions of sigma plus, d minus two functions of sigma minus. Okay, now um, what, what, what do we do? Last time, what we did was in order to fix this ambiguity, in order to fix this ambiguity, we took one of the functions, which we chose to be x minus, okay, and set all the non-zero mode parts of it to be. By this coordinate definition. Because of the periodicity of the sigma coordinate, we couldn't touch the zero mode parts. You yeah, couldn't redefine that way. Because that would break periodicity. So this was alpha prime p minus tau, and then something I forgot to write last time. So there's a center of mass. That's always there. Just some constant. So, uh, so we were able to use our gauge redundancy to set this, this thing to this one. Okay? That made it manifest that once we're in this gauge, it's manifest that there are d minus 2 difference. There are d minus 1 uh, left uh, after we clear this gauge and then this constraint. Okay. Now, okay, uh, now the question is how do we take this classical phase space, this classical space of solutions, and quantize it? Okay? Uh, can, can you find a reasonable procedure? that will allow you to take this classical physics that we've solved completely and to convert it into quantum theory. Okay? So in order to do that, I'm going to give you a 5 or 10 minute introduction, a 5 to 10 minute introduction to a, a way of thinking of quantization that is possibly broader and more, but the, we make very limited use of it. It is possibly broader than, than ways you have been introduced to before. 
actually people who took my quantum mechanics one class, we use this method to quantize lambda over They don't think you've worked on that. Uh, okay, so this, this method goes has fancy name, it's called geometric quantization. So the, the, we, will, we, will, we will use uh, such a small part of it that we won't require much names or terminologies or anything like that, but let's just see the method. You see, how do we normally do quantization? What we normally do is to say, well, uh, so suppose we were just taking non-relative quantum mechanics, we had x and p. Okay? We say that well, there, there are these variables x and p. And then we have, they have a Poisson bracket such that this thing is 1. And then we, uh, uh, we, we, uh, we raise this Poisson bracket to uh, a commutator, x commutator p is i. We multiply Poisson brackets by i and make them true as commutator relations. Okay. But as you know from the study of classical mechanics, as you know from the study of classical mechanics, you know, this structure of a commutator, the stru structure of a Poisson bracket, uh, or even if you didn't know any of this, I mean, the structure of the Poisson bracket is a structure that is geometrical and is not tied to a particular set of variables. Not, not tied to the set of var variables x and p. Okay? You can use any variables in phase space and define a Poisson bracket, you know, for these for these variables. Okay, so let's see. Let's see more. You know what, what I mean. Look. So let's given a set of variables of phase space. Let's say that at the moment we're dealing with x i and p i. J is there's more than one x, more than one p. No. Okay. Let's say that this thing is a omega i j. Okay. Where omega i j is delta i j. Uh, uh, is delta i j, uh, and we, we, all, we also have okay. So if we had a system of n x's and n p's, we've got a matrix, this omega matrix, which is 2n cross 2n dimension, and it's an anti-symmetric matrix. Okay? Now, if you want to move to more general variables than x's and p's, it's better to think of this omega as a tensor of the matrix. Okay? It's a tensor in uh, uh, both of those indices are upper. Okay? Though, in order to do manipulations with it, I will find it more convenient to define the inverse of omega. Okay? It's, this is a matrix, both of whose indices are lower. Okay? And to do my manipulations with that inverse of omega. That inverse of omega turns out to be the more geometrical object. Okay? So what is the inverse of omega? Well, once we've got omega, we can find its inverse. Okay? Um, so if omega, remember x i p j. So I mean, writing x i and p j to say that it's the Poisson bracket with x on the left p, right? Was was equal to uh, delta i j. It's easy to convince yourself that omega with the lower x i and p j is equal to minus delta i j. Yeah, this is the fact that the, that uh, um, so zero one minus one zero is the inverse of minus. In order to make it square to one, you need to put a minus there. Make a bubble matrix. Okay? So instead of dealing with this, this object here, this object which is an anti-symmetric tensor the, the, the on phase space, okay, I deal with this object here. Okay. Now, whenever you have an anti-symmetric or anti-symmetric tensor of any rank, but with lower indices, there is convenient notation to deal with this anti-symmetric object. That we're not going to use. Okay? This notation uh, has names, it makes it a form, but it's just notation. <laughs> I'm going to encode these components, omega xi pj, into a geometric object, which I'll call omega, which is which is omega xi pj, dxi, d, and then the symbol here, d. Purely form. It, 
in, in order to understand what it means, it has the same, same formal content as the translation between the components of a metric and the expression for an infinitesimal distance. Right? So, 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 so this, when, when you have a metric, you can characterize it by GIJ. You can equally characterize it by a formula for the infinitesimal line element, which is, DS, which is scale out. ds squared is equal to GIJ dxi dxj. So what I'm doing is taking this equivalent of metric, which is the symplectic form, and multiplying it by some formal object. Okay? This thing here has an interpretation for sort of infinitesimal lengths. This thing is a formal object, and the, the only property of this formal object that we will use, the only property of this formal object that we will use is that it's anti-symmetric. You know, uh, uh, because only uh, we're doing this for an anti-symmetric object with lower emphasis. Uh, we, we encode the fact that this tensor is anti-symmetric into a formal property of this D object. Okay, so the formal property we use is that DA wedge DT is equal to minus DT wedge DT. Later on in this course, you know, maybe middle of next semester, we will return to a study of this, these geometrical ideas in much more detail. This, not for use in quantization then, but use in, in study of compactification. Okay, so it's good to get used to this notation and these ideas anyway. So we'll be in that a lot later on. But at the moment, we don't want to go to systematically. This, this is all I need about this object is that it's. Okay, now, why have I told you all of this? I've told you all of this because there's a very nice way of thinking of the symplectic structure, the Poisson bracket structure of classical theory. You see, as we have, uh, uh, as we discussed in the previous class, a good so a covariant way of thinking of phase space is to think of it as a class, okay, as as the uh, uh, set of all classical solutions of the system. Okay, now an action induces a Poisson bracket structure, a symplectic form, on the space of solutions. If you label solutions by initial values of x and initial values of p, that symplectic structure is best just delta p wedge delta x. It's not delta x wedge delta p, because remember this property. Once we lower, you, you, you pick up an additional minus. Okay? So, what, what, uh, so, so uh, if, you, if you use x and p to label solutions, the symplectic structure on that labeling of solutions is just delta x wedge delta p. But the symplectic form is a geometric object, and can be expressed in any form. So once you have a parametrization of phase space, once you have a parametrization of phase space, if you want to know what the symplectic structure, what the Poisson bracket structure on this phase space is, what you have to do is to well, use canonical quantization to say that in the X and P parametrization, it's delta X wedge delta P, with a minus sign, and then use the usual rules of tensor transformations to go to the symplectic form in any other way. Okay? Now this notation makes that particularly convenient. Because if you've got a set, if you've got a set of uh, uh, solutions, explicitly, you know what xi is as a function of some parameters. You know what pi is for those solutions as a function of those parameters. In order to transform the symplectic form into form on these set of parameters, all you have to do is to put in what dx is in terms of d of those parameters. D transforms like a differential. You can easily check that that's like a differential element. That, that induces the right tensor transformation property. There's no omega. It's clear because the indices not Okay? So all you have to do is to substitute what delta x is in terms of delta of the parameters of your solution, delta p is in terms of the parameters of your solution, and then you have the Poisson bracket structure in terms of the parametrization of your phase space, <coughs> namely solution space, that you are, that is motion action. Okay? And then you can use that to invert this omega and find the Poisson brackets. Okay? On the, uh, uh, on the space of, uh, on the objects that you will promote to operators that you like. Not necessarily in terms of x and p. Is this clear? Now actually this procedure often lends you, it leads you into a, a symplectic structure that's not flat. It's not like, you know, 
in terms of new variables, you have constant functions times d something, d something. How to do the quantization then is a complicated and delicate story, which is the meat of geometric quantization, which we're not going to get in here, because luckily, in what we do at the moment, we'll always get flat symplectic spaces. So how to do the quantization will be great. Is this clear? Okay. So we're going to now implement this, use these, these ideas to quantize our state of space of solutions. <laughs> okay? Uh, uh, the, the beauty of these ideas is that it uses when you can classically solve a system. You've done a lot of the work. This way of quantization uses uses the fact that you've correctly understood what the right space of classical solution is. Okay? In order to promote the theory to a quality. That's the situation we're in. We completely understand the classical theory. We should be able to relatively easily get what theory out of it. Let's see how we do it. Is this clear? Okay, so let's move. So let's. Okay, we were going to gauge that we're working in. Okay, what was our action? Well, our action was 1 by 4 pi alpha, right? Integral d to sigma. Now we okay, let's say even before fixing the gauge, that was g g alpha beta del alpha x mu del alpha x mu and that's minus. Okay. Now, in order to get the symplectic structure of space of solutions, what is the symplectic structure? Just for every variable, it's dx where g. Summed over all variables. The variables are continuous, integrated over the variables. Okay? So, what are the variables in the game? There's g alpha, g alpha beta, and there are x moves. What is the symplectic contribution to the symplectic structure from g alpha beta? Sum it. Zero. It's zero because momentum can't give to g alpha beta. Let's see. So that dp part is just zero. Okay. What's the contribution? So, fine. So, you see, when we, when we gauge fix, we must be careful to use the symplectic structure of the whole theory before sitting on the slice that we're interested in. Okay? But in this particular case, since we're fixing g to something, g itself has no symplectic structure, we can just do the uh, quantization on that slice. Okay? We've not missed anything. We've not missed any contribution to the symplectic structure. There you go. The next, uh, okay. So, what is our symplectic structure? Well, now we might as well. Uh, you know, switch to dots and primes. So the action as far as quantization is concerned is the same thing as d to sigma x x mu. Okay. Now I'm going to split up into x plus dot x plus dot and this probably has a minus sign uh, x minus dot dot plus x plus prime x minus prime and then plus x x i dot squared minus x i dot squared. <coughs> uh, let me check if I got signs right here. This one would be uh, yeah, it, this is this right this x plus is t plus x. X minus t, t minus x. The part that comes from uh, t and t should appear with minus sign. Yeah, uh, yeah, so that's that's correct. Okay, so this is our action. So what's the symplectic form that follows from this action? Okay? So the symplectic form that follows from this action is 1 by 4 pi, but uh, now when we c compute the momentum conjugate to any variable, okay, that's what it's done, 1 by 4 pi alpha prime, then uh, integral, now the momentum conjugate to x minus, okay, the momentum conjugate to x minus is minus x plus dot, okay, so we get minus x plus dot delta of this, that's delta of the same as d. Here we are writing delta as a function. Okay? Wedge delta of x minus. Okay? What's the momentum conjugate to x plus minus x minus dot? 
So plus so minus delta of x minus dot wedge delta of x plus. Okay? And then plus sum over i uh, two times delta of x i dot wedge delta of Is this clear? Momentum can't be different any variable times a variable. So this factor of 2 is momentum can't be different any size as a 2. Delta x, delta the same symbol as d. I'm, I'm using the symbol delta because it's a variation of a function, small variation of a function rather than a small variation of a number. Uh, I could write d if you want. It's just a formula. It's the basis and space of one form. It doesn't matter. Just the basis behind which you write your omega. This, this has exactly the same information as the statement that the Poisson bracket between x minus and x plus dot is a delta function. That's all that this is saying. It's standard economic organization. X plus it doesn't contribute to uh, symplectic structure because symplectic structure is only derivative with momentum is derivative at the time. Okay, very good. Now, this is formally correct. However, we know what the right space of physical solutions is. Okay, so what is the correct space of physical solutions? The correct space of physical solutions, apparently, the label distinct physical solutions. Okay, are what? We can write xi as equal to, and I should write it the way I wrote in my notes. And the way everyone writes it, it's an odd way to write it, but standard. xi is equal to x plus i, xi plus plus xi minus, where xi. Uh, plus is equal to sum of alpha prime by 2 the arbitrary an arbitrary function of x plus so that respects periodicities okay so that's uh, sum not n not equal to 0 um, alpha n divided by minus i n into the power minus i n plus and then I should also write zero mode contribution so that's x i 0 plus uh, uh, alpha prime where root alpha prime P I done and X minus I is equal to alpha prime by 2 sum n not equal to 0 alpha n tilde by minus I n alpha minus I n what have I done? Okay, I still have to write down some part that makes it with x plus and x minus. We do that in a moment. But here, what have I done? I've just taken an arbitrary function of xi and Fourier transformed it at a zero matrix. The Fourier coefficient have been written with some strange prefactors, but that's my choice. It's the choice of the matrix. I can redefine a new Fourier variable of you know, an is alpha n divided by minus i n. This would just be standard. Is this clear? That these numbers alpha n, alpha n tilde, and x0 i and pi, plus one, a couple of additional numbers that I've written down, uh, have to do with the x plus x minus set, give you a full labeling of all classical solutions. Of course, uh, there are reality conditions here. Yeah? Um, you know, alpha n will have to be the complex particular of alpha minus n. In order for this function to be real. So then we will keep that in mind. Is this here? Okay, questions, comments. If you have any questions, comments, please. Please, 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 please stop me. If it's not clear to anyone, please say. You know, the, the ideas are simple, but they may be answered.
If you have anyone has questions like the other people have the same question, don't be embarrassed. So, so what happens this explosion Wait, we can't do that. Yeah. We've not yet done <laughs> Okay. But we, as we've seen before, this does not exhaust the space of solutions completely. Firstly, the constraint equations as we saw last class determine everything but the zero mode of x plus once we fix this gauge. Because it determine del plus of x plus and determine del minus of x plus, uh, x plus, but it can tell you the zero modes. So that's what are the remaining, so, uh, so what are the remaining parameters? So there's x plus, which is equal to something that's completely determined. And it will turn out, luckily, that we don't need to investigate this formula. Hello? This is a teaching class. <laughs> okay? So, uh, but plus there's a, a new parameter that's important because it can parameterize the new solutions. Okay, that's an initial parameter in the space of solutions. The zero one. Plus, x minus is more rich. x minus has a square root alpha prime p minus tau, which we sometimes like to think of as sigma plus plus sigma minus by 2. Okay, and then there's little x minus. So there are three new parameters. There are three additional numbers that parameterize solutions in the x plus x minus sum. Sorry, uh, namely x0 plus x0 minus and three minus. It's where we get from solving the constraint in terms of all sums. X0 plus is the, z the, uh, the zero mode. Okay, that is undetermined by the constraint equations. The constraint equation only tells you about derivatives of x plus. So it's, it's, it's some constant piece, no information. Okay? So Yes, all of this is n not equal to uh, Alpha n tilde by minus i n e to the power minus i n sigma. Okay, now we want to determine the symplectic structure on the space of solutions. So all we have to do is to plug in these classical solutions into the symplectic form. Okay, but even before we start doing this in detail, and we will soon, okay? But even before we start doing it, we see something very nice. Because delta x minus. So what is delta? Delta is a variation as you move on the space of solutions. Okay? X minus has only one parameter, or two parameters, two parameters in which solutions change. X plus is much richer because this function is a function of all these alphas. So delta x plus is something very complicated. You know, because um, uh, delta x minus is very simple. Delta x minus comes only from these parts, and these parts have no Fourier modes, as Fourier mode equal to zero. Okay, that initially tells you that the only part of, uh, and then using the fact that if you've got a, you've got a constant function and you Fourier and get integrated over from zero to two pi, okay, a constant function multiplying another function. The only part of that function that's picked out is the zero mode of that function. You see, that the only part that enters a symplectic form, the only part of x plus that enters a symplectic form, is the zero mode of x plus. Right. So, what, what, what do we have? Suppose we plug this space of solutions into the symplectic form. Okay? Let's look at this part of the symplectic form to start with. This delta x minus is what? It's delta p. Okay? In, so, so let's write down. Let's write down the contribution from uh, uh, from this term. Uh, let's write down the contribution of this term. Okay? So we get delta of x dot plus del, well, let's write it down from this term. So delta of x dot minus 
where the delta of x comes from. Integrate. Now this integral includes an integral of a sigma. What is delta of x dot minus? Okay, delta of x dot minus is simply alpha prime delta p minus. Because delta acts on all the parameters and radius and everything. Okay? And then we are waiting for delta of x plus. So while delta x plus is in general something very complicated, when you also do the integral, the only part of the x plus that survives is the zero mode. Where you probably Fourier transforms. Okay, so what do we know about zero? There are two pieces in the zero part. Okay? There's the part that comes from here, and there's a the part that comes from the time dependence. The p plus, alpha prime p plus. Tau. Okay? Now, the part that comes from here will contribute very simply. It's just, it will have some delta of x0 plus. The part that comes from the time dependence is very complicated. It's very complicated because p plus is a very complicated function of all of, all of this stuff. As we will see in a moment, you know, if you imagine, imagine doing the following solve for x plus. We have delta of x plus is equal to constant times delta xi delta xi. That's the constraint equation. Now look at the zero Fourier mode of that equation. That will give you p plus on the left hand side is equal to everything that has harmonic oscillator n with harmonic oscillator minus n from the quadratic term of the right hand side. So it's bilinear as an alpha and that's very complicated. Is this clear? So all the complication in quantization. Everything else is going to be very simple. The part from the i's are going to be very simple. But all the com complication in quantization comes from the fact that p plus is a very complicated function of everything else. So if we actually have plugged this into the symplectic form, what p plus is in the function of everything else, in a very complicated symplectic form, and it would look like that, life would be very complicated, but we don't have to do that. Why is that? We don't have to do that because Three is an odd number. Okay, so let me say this more clearly. As we will see very soon, the, not, the variables here in the xi sector appear in canonical conjugate phase. You know, give us a nice structure of phase space. Okay, but so what we're left with is, is these three different uh, are these three different numbers characterizing solutions. But you can't put a symplectic structure in an odd dimension. Can't put a non-degenerate symplectic structure in non-dimensional space. You know this from Poisson brackets. Poisson brackets always come in pairs. If you have a, a third guy, it would have to be something in which the Poisson bracket, you know, is, is zero. Another way of saying it is that if you take any symmetric any, any anti-symmetric matrix and it's odd, it's going to be degenerate. So like all zeros. Okay? So it's a fundamental property that, that if you want to promote, you want to do some, some symplectic kind of structure and promote that right algebra, you must, many cons the consistency conditions must be obeyed. One of which is that, one, the simplest of which is that you must be working in even dimension space. Okay. So, when you've got an odd dimensional phase space, when you've got an odd dimensional phase space, you can't use this method of quantization unmodified. However, in this situation, this is the same thing is what Dirac used to call, well, this is an example of what Dirac used to call first class constraints. And it's a situation in which the second method that we've already seen in these lectures is just And the second method is the following. Let us forget about the fact that P plus is determined. Let's forget about the fact that P plus is determined by these constraints for a moment. And let's promote that to a dynamic level. So we say it's square root alpha prime P plus time. And then do the quantization. So now we've got a new solution. It's going to be large enough phase space. How do we cure the fact that we did large enough phase space? Then we take the constraint that would have determined P plus and impose it as an operator equation. Okay? Uh, on our system. So that's the method we're going to follow. We're going to take this fictitiously, slightly enlarged class of solutions. Elaborate one time. Do the quantization and impose the, the one non trivial equation, the equation that would have determined P plus as a function of everything else, as an operator equation on the Hilbert space. Okay? This is going to 
will give us something reason. Okay, we should have the there are other words in X plus, but those are completely solved for by the constraint. You said, better to say, they just don't enter the symplectic structure, as we've argued. Right? See, what? The space of solutions doesn't care about what those other words are. The only way in which those other words could affect the physical base space is by contributing to the symplectic structure on physical base space. But we see that it doesn't work. It's only the zero mode part that, that can work. It's the zero mode we have to deal with. Is this clear? Well, it's roughly as fishy as the kinds of things we did in quantum mechanics in the first class. You increase the number of variables and take constraints and impose them as operating functions. You know. In the end, the test of a good quantization is, is it a, does it give you a consistent quantum theory that has all the properties? Now, we will, we will do a more systematic quantization, a path integral quantization, which is less ambiguous. We will clear starting point, path integral. We will do a more systematic quantization in the next few lectures. Uh, you will be able to form it again. But at the moment, let's, let's get the answer without such findings. Is this clear? Uh, as I said last class, it's very important as a research physicist, to be able to do something rough and in, you know not completely, you know something that won't necessarily satisfy mathematics, but get the answer fast, because that that way you see whether something interesting is happening. If something interesting comes out, then you spend a lot of time understanding it. But if it's not going to be interesting, why you know why bother? So it's very important to to do rough investigation before being very thorough. Okay, good. So now let's let's complete our quantization. So what we're going to do is to take this class of solutions with this symplectic form, and this class of solutions with this symplectic form, and uh, uh, do the quantization imposing that one, one or rather two, because there's one in the x plus set and one in the x minus set, uh, remaining constraints. Okay. So let's first so let's first do the quantization and then quantify the constraints. Okay. So let's first deal with the xi sectors. So the xi sectors we we plugged in like this. Now we have to plug that into the symplectic. <laughs> okay, so what do we get? Okay, let's first deal with the zero mode of xi. The zero mode of xi is very simple. What we want to do is to plug the zero mode expansion into into one by two alpha. Okay, one by two pi alpha bracket. But now you do the integral over sigma that gives you a factor of 2 pi. So it's like 1 by 4 pi alpha, right? Then you do the integral over sigma and that gives you a factor of 2 pi. So that's 1 by 2 alpha, right? Times integral of, uh, there's a 2 here, so that gives that. And then we have integral of, uh, um, we have integral of delta of alpha prime p i wedge delta of delta of x zero i is this here see what I'm doing is that we've got a quadratic expression which only gives you something non-zero if a, if a, if a mode n meets mode minus n in sigma. So the zero modes can only click with themselves. So I'm isolating out the contribution of the zero modes. Is this clear? Okay, I've just taken this expansion, plug it in here, and see what I get from zero modes. Okay, when I do x dot, I don't get anything from x zero. Okay? And I'm doing it at tau equals zero, so at tau equals zero, this thing is zero unless I get a time out. Is this clear? Okay? So, uh, oh, sorry. Did I have square root of, I, I, if I had put square root alpha prime with properties. This expansion should have been without square roots. I'm sorry about that. Should be basically chosen to cancel this alpha prime. Yeah? This is not square root. Okay? So, this is simply. 
delta pi wedge delta epsilon. This is a standard px commutation relationship for quantum mechanics. Is this clear? So the quantization of the zero mode sector is very simple. The Hilbert space. Square integrable functions of x0y and momentum is operated and is implemented by the differential operator. This is the u, this we get landed up to the zero modes, the same problem as ordinary quantum mechanics. Is this clear? Okay? Now, what about the x plus x minus sector? The x plus x minus sectors all are zero modes. Okay? So if, if I wanted to, I could move back to the coordinates x0 and x1. And then the quantization of the zero modes is exact for each of these things is exactly like the, any of the x axis. So I think don't need to say anything new about the quantization of these coordinates. It's exactly the same as this. Is this clear? So we quantize all the zero modes. What we've landed up with is functions of 20 of d vectors. Yeah, with differential operators being implemented as parameters. Uh, we have been written on the zero modes which are is from n to n. You see, what we're trying to do is try the symplectic structure on zero modes. Okay. okay. That will not be the symplectic structure on alpha n. We, we're doing that. But uh, x0 and p enter into the symplectic structure only in this form. We've completely done that. And the quantization of that sector is clear. It's decoupled, right? The zero modes don't talk to the other things. So we've got one Hilbert space that is just functions of d variables, square and integral functions of d variables. Is this clear? Okay. Now, what about the rest? So let's move to that.
and then there's a part of delta x, not delta x dot, this term, yes? Yeah? Okay, which uh, okay, let me be more systematic. Let me, let me click, add 1 by 4 pi and I'm not yet done the integral. This is d sigma, a b sigma, a b sigma. Wedge delta alpha n divided by minus i n is by minus i n sigma plus delta alpha n tilde minus i n is by minus i n sigma. Okay, really there's a summation over n here. Summation over n here, summation over m here. You know, some different variable. M and there's the integral. Tau equal to zero, both sigma plus and sigma minus two become basically sigma. Basically sigma but there's a minus sign. No. Yes. So sigma plus and sigma minus are sigma and minus. Okay, let's let's make that replace the Sigma plus is sigma and sigma minus is minus sigma. Now that we've taken the time derivative, we can just make it. Okay, sigma plus, this is plus and this is minus. Okay, so this is sigma plus is sigma. I am sigma and had a minus and this is plus i. Right, sorry for the unsystematic nature of this statement. If anything is unclear, please ask. This summation both over n and n. But this summation, the, because of the integral, we get a, a kick only when the Fourier boards add up to zero. Okay, so there are two kinds of terms. There are the terms in which you have alpha with alpha, and the terms, or alpha tilde with alpha tilde, or the terms in which you have alpha with alpha tilde and alpha tilde with alpha. Now, the first thing to notice is that the terms with, between alpha and alpha tilde add up to zero. Because you have, okay, so it only, it only clicks when. Uh, uh, n is equal to n, and then you get delta alpha n wedge delta alpha tilde n plus delta alpha tilde uh, alpha tilde n wedge delta alpha n both divided by uh, both divided by minus i. Is this clear? The two ends are the same, so we don't have to worry about which which any of the denominator. Sorry, uh, I think why you are taking uh, the W2 Well, quantization is done on a constant time slice. Right. So it doesn't matter which time. So you're choosing that you time. Still choosing it to be You can check that symplectic form is invariant under time translation. Right. So it doesn't matter. Because of the and is symmetric, this is just it. Is this clear? So we forget about the terms which have alpha and alpha and alpha and alpha. Okay. Now you might think, well, uh, is the other set of terms also going to give us zero because of anti symmetry? But it's not. Okay, I'm clear in this. It's not going to give us zero because. Here we get non-zero clicks between alpha and n and alpha at minus n. n plus n has to be equal to zero. Okay, so let's try now what we get. We get 1 by 4 pi, then delta alpha n wedge delta alpha minus n. Okay, now the 4 pi has become 1 by 2 because of the 2 pi that we get from an integral over sigma. So 1 by 2, delta alpha n by delta alpha minus n, and divided by minus i of m, but n was minus n. 
sebelas ayat. Right? Uh, this is sampai over n, n, and you get the same thing with the other things. <coughs> Sum over all non-zero values. Okay, but when you when you take minus the contribution from let's say, look at the contribution from n equals 20 and n equals minus 20, these two contributions add instead of subtract because the denominator changes sign and you get a sign change when you flip the positions. Okay, the key point was clicking was between n and minus n instead of n. And therefore, this thing can be written as n is equal to 1 to infinity of delta alpha n divided by delta alpha minus n divided by i n plus delta alpha tilde n which delta alpha tilde minus n divided by i n. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> so, quantization of this sector is now also totally you see, you've got a bunch of terms, each of which is quadratically decoupled, <coughs> decoupled from everything else. Alpha n talks to alpha minus n. I should also have been putting an i in the x I'll do it now. So, if you have any one scalar, you know, all the xi's. Okay? I should have been putting that, I just put it in the end. Okay, now, what is the correct quantization of this symplectic form? Well, we know that. If we had del delta something which delta something, that is the commutator. The second with the first has commutator i. Okay, this is telling us what the omega is with lower indices. So omega with lower indices has an additional factor of i n in the denominator. Therefore, omega with upper indices has an additional factor of i n in the numerator. So we conclude that this with this has a commutation relation of x and b times i n. Okay? Therefore we conclude that alpha minus n i, commutator alpha n i is equal to i times i n. Okay? Or alpha n i commutator alpha minus n and reverse positions to get a minus sign is equal to n. <coughs> okay? In fact, if I make this more general, of course, there's only commutators between alpha to the same n. So I can write this more or alpha to the same i. So I can write this more generally as delta i mean delta i j. That completes our quantization. We've, we've got to implement the, uh, we've, got, we've, got, we've got a Hilbert space with these alphas that have to stop. Now, what does this combination relate to mean? This is basically harmonic oscillator, creation operator, sorry, annihilation operator, creation operator with frequency n. The remaining part of our Hilbert space is a bunch of harmonic oscillators with frequency that goes from 1, 2, 3, 4 up to infinity. Okay, 1, 2, 3, 4 up to infinity. And there are d minus 2 copies of these. Actually, d minus 2 times 2 copies of these, because although I've not mentioned it, everything that we do for the alphas also holds the alpha filters. Is this clear? Okay? So we've got d minus 2 times 2 sequences of harmonic oscillators with frequencies 1 to infinity. That, 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 you know, so 
each of these Hilbert spaces tensor with each other, tensor with the Hilbert space of functions, square integrable functions of variables. That is a full that is a full Hilbert space that we get from condensation. Is this clear? Okay, now I want to go on to an analysis of the constraint, but I don't want to do that until I get some feedback from you. Has this been clear? Okay, before I, yeah, okay, let me, let me do the analysis of the constraint, and then, then we come back. Okay, so, um, I want to say two or three things. I've used slightly fancy techniques to do the quantization here. The, the techniques for, for fancy, and the reason I use these slightly fancy techniques, but first it's much faster than standard techniques. And, 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 and second, if the logic for this way of proceeding is much clearer when said in this language. However, what, you could, what, all, what I have done in content is exactly the same as the following. Start from the action we wrote down right at the end of last class. That is an action for zero modes for all coordinates and oscillators for, for d minus two coordinates. And do the quantization of the system any way you want. Just do the standard thing that Pesk and Schroeder does, for instance. You know, for quantization of one plus one dimensional field thing. However you do it, you get this answer. So anyone who it's un uh, uh, it, it, not, in both cases, we've not yet dealt with the constraint. Last time, I also secretly enlarged the Hilbert space a little bit without, <coughs> without us seeing what was going on. Yeah, this is much clearer because we see what was going on. Okay, but anyway, so uh, what I want to say is that the quantization we've done so far is exactly the same as what you get if you start with the action we wrote down right at the end of last class in zero modes for all coordinates, oscillators would be minus two, and did the quantization anyway. Parameterize configuration space in some set of variables, find the conjugate momentum, try, try, turn these into harmonic oscillators in every way you want to, and you'll find that it's exactly the same as this. Okay, this is just a little faster. Okay? Anyone who feels uncomfortable with the way we, you know, with all these delta of this and symplectic forms and I don't know all this stuff, just take that action we started with the end of last class. This is a very useful exercise, strongly recommend it. Use your favorite method of quant canonical quantization and find the answer. You'll get this answer. Okay? Please do that if you feel uncomfortable. This was it's not necessary to be jazzy, except for the logic, where it's as much clearer this way. Okay, now this is the first part. Um, yeah. Now well that was the old the 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 the, uh, the thing we want to do now is to close the constraint. Okay. So, what was the constraint? So the constraint was yeah. So the constraint was the equation del plus x mu del plus x mu equals zero. And a similar one with minus. So let's leave with the plus x. So what we get from the zero mode part of this constraint? You see, the zero mode part of the constraint, you remember what x mu was. x mu was equal to x zero mu, that clearly does the constraint equation, plus <coughs> alpha prime p mu into sigma plus plus sigma minus by 2. Okay? Plus also. Plus, in fact, let's write it. So like this. Uh, the oscillator part is only accurate for the i's, but it's alpha prime by 2, um, alpha prime by 2, and then alpha n by minus i n, e to the power minus i n. Okay, where this part is correct only if we put about the other. You understand that, right? Don't need the first two terms for x0, x, x1. Okay. So let's evaluate this constraint. Let's first see what the zero modes give us. Okay. So what do we get from zero modes? 
So from the zero words we get, uh, the only contribution to the zero words is the plus hits sigma plus. So we just get alpha prime p mu p mu by four. <coughs> by four because tau was sigma plus sigma minus by two. We get two factors of by two. Is this clear? Okay. Ah, I, I, I should have said that of course we are only interested in that part of this is very clear it's a function equation. It's a function of sigma. But as we've seen before, we're only interested in the part if the part of the constraint is zero mode on uh, in sigma. Okay? So we are only interested in the zero frequency Fourier component of this. So we're interested in the integral of this constraint over sigma. Because everything else relates uh, oscillate as a sigma plus. Okay, to the coordinates of interest and oscillators, sigma plus are just normal quantization. We don't care about that. It's true, but we don't care. Express. Yeah, express. Okay? So the only term in X plus that is in our quantization is P plus. That is the term that's going to get constrained. Okay? So the only term in the constraint equation that's of interest to us, that's not relating something outside what we are interested in, okay, is the zero mode of the integral of that constraint over sigma. Okay? And that's what I'm evaluating. I'm just taking the part that is no Fourier mode, no Fourier frequency. Okay. What are we going to get from this, this other stuff? Okay. From uh, uh, <coughs> Well, from the other stuff, what do we get? I'm getting powers of alpha prime wrong. Just sitting there. Okay, let's let's. Oh, this alpha prime squared. The two two factors of alpha prime in our moment. So yeah, expansion at alpha prime gives you not squared. And now from the from the zero mode part, what we get? Uh, sorry, from the oscillators, what we get? Well, we get um, alpha prime by two because we got something squared. And then we get uh, uh, sigma uh, You see, now when we take the delta of this, these ions vanish. So we just get sigma alpha n i alpha minus n. Some alpha is n goes from n is not equal to zero. the only zero frequency part of that constraint. Okay? Great. So now we're nearly through. Sorry? Take the contributions from X plus and X plus. X plus, this, yes. So all that is involved there is letting this mu run over all of this. Because zero mode part, part of X plus X minus is the same. Okay? So let's just Say that this is summed only over i, i equals one to one to d minus two, but this is summed over it. Okay, uh, two questions. The x minus yes. doesn't have any uh, any mode. I think like it is oscillator. Yes. It doesn't have any oscillator. Yes. But x plus has oscillator mode, which can in principle give a contribution like this. Well, x the x plus oscillator modes are determined by the constraint equations. In terms of everything else. Yes. So they're not they don't they're not labels on phase space. The space of solution is completely determined by what the oscillator modes of the D minus two. Okay? That is a complete characterization of the space of solutions. Now the only way in which the fact that X plus does oscillate that it does, the only way in which that could affect our quantization is in contributing to the symplectic form in terms of the other elements. You see. X plus, apart from zero modes, is determined, what X plus is doing is determined by, by what the other is doing. So there are no new degrees of freedom associated with X plus. It's just a question of whether or what that stuff flapping around affects the symplectic form for the labels of our solutions. Or not. Okay? And we've gone through this argument to demonstrate that it doesn't. 
Well, it does in a certain way from this P-class business, but we take that into account by imposing it instead. It's the only way. Good. Please keep asking. This is very important. It's very important. Okay. Uh, it's not clear to me why why explicit oscillator. Okay. The, the, let's say we have an oscillator mode which would be like alpha plus. Yes. Okay. It's there. And it's a function. It can be. It's some function. It will, it, will, it will be from alpha plus to the power i s minus i s. Where alpha plus is given by a bilinear function of alpha n i s. Yeah. That's right. Okay. okay. But but so now how do we now that. But that function, yes, we enter. No, I can enter. Okay, not the zero mode of the constraint. You see, we're taking this constraint and integrating over sigma. Yes. So anything with non-zero frequency drops out, right? It would be non-zero frequency because sig sig x minus is only zero frequency. Okay. That, okay. That, that's because if one of them is x plus, another is x plus. Exactly. If one is x plus, the other. Good, good, good. Okay, fine. So let uh, so, so 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 let's go. So let's understand what this thing is. See, we've got the summation over all n. Okay, but uh, the summation over all n can uh, includes both n positive and n negative. Now, when n negative is to the right, we've got the creation operators to the right. Remember, we saw that alpha n with n positive was like destruction, like the case. Okay, when n <coughs> uh, positive is to the right, we've got the create uh, destruction operations to the right. Now it's always a good idea to write things in long, long order form. So let's do that. So we've got the, the equation zero is equal to alpha prime squared uh, p mu p mu by four plus. <laughs> 